Area's two big problem areas continue to be 66 and the Wilson Bridge. Starting on the westbound 66, it is very slow, just crawling about 5 or 10 miles an hour. From before 123 out to the Fairfax County Parkway, the problem is construction outbound 66 near the Fairfax County Parkway blocking the right lane. Now the Wilson Bridge... The time of the end is an expression that appears exclusively in the prophetic book of Daniel. However, similar expressions are used in the Bible, such as the final part of the days, the conclusion of the system, the last days, and the day of the Lord. All these terms relate to a relatively brief period of time when the present human civilization will be thrown into terminal chaos. For now, though, people go about their daily lives in relative carefreeness. They're buying, they're selling, they're building and planting, eating and drinking, they're marrying and planning for the future, raising the hoped-for next generation. And most are oblivious that the world ominously stands at the brink of a great war, an unprecedented global disaster, a catastrophe that will undoubtedly surpass the horrors and hardships wrought by the 20th century's two bloody world wars. And it is not something that might happen years from now. In many ways, the pushing war has already begun, evidenced by the proxy wars using terrorists, cyber wars, economic and trade wars. Censorship and propaganda wars are heating up to levels characteristic of wartime. For the past few decades, America and the Western world, nominally identified as Christian, have been in economic and cultural decay. Conversely, China, India, Russia, and Iran have been developing economically and militarily, and in alliance pose a formidable block, posing a challenge to the continuation of the decrepit Anglo-American post-World War II dominance of the world. But the real conflict originates within the very Anglo-American dyad, which in reality is the fusion of two inimical systems of government and economy. One system is the rule of empire, expressed through London's monetary and financial system, of which Wall Street and the central banking system is the primary mechanism of control. The other system is the nation state and sovereign credit. Those two opposed systems are symbolized in Bible prophecy as the kings of the north and south, as well as the iron and clay feet of the metallic image. The feet being composed of two incongruous materials that do not weld together, expressed most vividly in the Anglo-American alliance of empire and republic. During the time of the end, these two incompatible systems come into open conflict, with one becoming the unequivocal victor, 
the book of Revelation describes the victor as the eighth king, which will most likely be a communistic world government administered by the United Nations. Besides the intensifying conflict between the atomic powers, nations are becoming increasingly polarized within. Racial and political fault lines are being exploited to foment strife and fear. But divisions are especially pronounced in the widening chasm between rich and poor. Since the global financial crash in 2008, the central banks have flooded the world with money, most of it going to prop up the banks and their wealthy clients. The Yellow Vest uprising in France, which appears to be spreading to other nations in Europe, is an expression of a revolt of the ruled against their rulers and the bankers who pull the strings. Civil wars are the likely outcome of the great inequity that has developed. The iron represents the empire, which has existed in various and sundry forms since Bible times, originating through the Greek and Roman cultures that are the foundations of the extended European civilization today. For example, the European Union is an empire that supersedes the sovereignty of the individual nations making up the Union. The clay appropriately symbolizes the common man, who is said to have been made from the clay of the earth. The concept of republicanism, democracy, and the nation-state is a relatively new development stemming from the Renaissance and the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648, which ended Europe's 30 years religious war and established national sovereignty as inviolable above popes and feudal lords. The avowed goal of the empire is to dissolve the Westphalian system. The global conflict that is now in the beginning stages will unavoidably unleash the most destructive weapons ever devised and lead up to a calamity that the scriptures describe as the Great Tribulation, about which Jesus said, Unless those days were cut short, no flesh would be saved. But on account of the chosen ones, those days will be cut short. Aligned president of Russia, Vladimir Putin, recently warned the West that they should not underestimate the seriousness of the aggression being directed at Russia and China, that it could easily result in a nuclear conflagration. Even the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists have adjusted their so-called doomsday clock to reflect that reality. 
It is now just two minutes until midnight and ticking. But most people reason, surely the leaders of the nations would not be so stupid so as to risk the extermination of all mankind. After all, the military doctrine known as MAD, an acronym for Mutually Assured Destruction, is credited with having prevented a nuclear war between the USSR and the USA during the 40-year Cold War. Some analysts, though, claim that the situation now is much more dire. However, there is another factor to consider, a greater reality that emanates from a realm which the vast majority of mankind are oblivious to, but which is the essence of the truth preached by Jesus Christ himself. The truth is, the truth revealed by Jesus, there are extremely destructive evil entities that are much more powerful than mere humans, and they are capable of overreaching and influencing not only individuals, but nations and the world at large. Those evil influencers are the demons, whom Jesus referred to as unclean spirits. They are also known as Satan's angels, he being their leader, of whom Jesus said he was a murderer and a liar when he began. According to Jesus, it is this murderous angel and his demons who are the unseen rulers of this spiritually bedarkened world. They were once righteous spirit sons of God, angels, but are now the implacable enemies of both God and man. And when Christ comes in his kingdom, the demonic gods of this world will literally go mad. To gain some insight into the extent of Satan's influence over mankind, the twelfth chapter of Revelation reveals that Satan is misleading the entire inhabited earth. But how did this situation come about? And why does God allow the demons to mislead the world to its own destruction? It all began shortly after God created the first two humans, Adam and Eve, a cherub, a species of angel, who was originally assigned by Jehovah as a benevolent guardian in Eden, hatched a scheme to insert himself as the one to be worshipped. Unfortunately, Adam and Eve fell for it and chose to follow Satan in rebellion against God, even though, in all likelihood, those two naive humans were not aware of the existence of the invisible spirit behind the serpent. For all they knew, the serpent could speak intelligently. But that didn't matter. They disobeyed Jehovah's explicit command, and they knew it. Which is why they hid when God came looking for them. Their trusting relationship with their Creator was ruined. Because the scheming angel cleverly launched his plot before Adam and Eve had children, everyone born outside of Eden has been genetically damaged by the original sin. And as a result, we have been cut off from direct communication with the true God, and hence more easily deceived. That certainly explains the multitude of gods worshipped and religious beliefs down through the ages to this present day. Also, to make matters worse, other angels join the devil in rebellion. They misuse their power to materialize in the flesh in order to have sex with the damaged but beautiful women, the children of Adam and Eve. The materialized angels even fathered their own offspring by the sinful daughters of Adam and Eve, called the Nephilim. Jehovah tolerated the situation for several hundred years, but then his judgment came, and God annihilated that world by means of a global deluge. 
only eight people survived the cataclysm known as Noah's Flood. Although the world perished, including the freakish sons born from the unholy union of angels and women, the sons of God that had come down to earth did not drown. They dematerialized and resumed their place in heaven. However, they did not escape God's judgment. Concerning them, the Christian writer Jude wrote, and the angels who did not keep their original position, but forsook their own proper dwelling place, he has reserved with eternal bonds in dense darkness for the judgment of the great day. Evidently, the bonds of restraint placed upon the condemned angels prevents them from materializing anymore. As wicked demons, though, they nonetheless still exert a powerful, malevolent influence over the world, which is evident in so very many ways. But the judgment of the great day is near, and the demons know it. Jesus himself referred to that great day, comparing his second coming and parousia to the great flood, when he said, Concerning that day and hour, nobody knows, neither the angels of the heavens nor the Son, but only the Father. For just as the days of Noah were, so the presence of the Son of Man will be. For as they were in those days before the flood, eating and drinking, men marrying and women being given in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and they took no note until the flood came and swept them all away. So the presence of the Son of Man will be. It should be noted, though, that the flood did not occur on the very day Noah entered into the massive ark he and his family had constructed. The Genesis account reveals that after the ark was loaded and the hand of God shut the door of the ark, the deluge did not begin until seven days later. But those who were not in the ark could not enter after Jehovah shut the door. The righteous and the wicked were separated. Significantly, when Jesus spoke of the flood and the presence of the Son of Man, he went on to say, Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken along and the other abandoned. Two women will be grinding at the hand mill. One will be taken along and the other abandoned. Keep on the watch, therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. Notice that Jesus describes a similar separation as took place when the door of the ark was shut. Those taken along and those abandoned are those who are in expectation of the coming of their Lord. Meaning, both individuals, the one taken and the one abandoned, are Christians. Take note, too, that Jesus also described a similar separation that he likened to a harvest, which he said is a conclusion of a system, also known as the time of the end. Jesus illustrated it as weeds and wheat that grow together in the same field up until the harvest, when the Son of Man will dispatch his angels who will gather the wheat into the storehouse and bundle up and burn the symbolic weeds. Again, a distinct and irreversible separation. Likewise, Jesus spoke of a faithful slave and an evil slave. One will be appointed over all the master's belongings, and the evil one will be thrown out. This is to occur when the master arrives unexpectedly to judge his household, something that has not occurred yet. Jesus also spoke an illustration of ten virgins who were waiting on the bridegroom. The wise virgins were allowed entry into the marriage feast, whereas the foolish were shut out, just like the wicked who were doomed on the day Noah entered the ark 
and God sealed the door. Just as there was an interval of some days from the time Noah entered the ark until the actual destruction, that is exactly what Christ illustrated in his various parables. The time of the end is a relatively short period of time, an interval marked off in scriptures as days and months, not years or decades, certainly not centuries. According to the sacred secret of God, the time of the end amounts to 42 months, or 1,260 days. The closing words of the sealed prophecy of Daniel also foretells a period of 1,290 days and 1,335 days, saying, Then he said, Go, Daniel, because the words are to be kept secret and sealed up until the time of the end. Many will cleanse themselves and whiten themselves and will be refined, and the wicked ones will act wickedly and none of the wicked will understand, but those having insight will understand. And from the time that the constant feature has been removed and the disgusting thing that causes desolation has been put in place, there will be 1,290 days. Happy is the one who keeps in expectation and who arrives at the 1,335 days. But as for you, go on to the end. You will rest, but you will stand up for your lot at the end of the days. During the time of the end, God's people will be crushed. Christ will then regather his scattered sheep, minus the wicked and faithless. The kingdom will then be fully established. God's two symbolic witnesses representing the sealed sons of the kingdom, will issue a scathing denunciation upon those locked out of the kingdom. Then the nations will resolve to destroy their tormentors. They will succeed in killing God's witnesses, which will bring about the situation known as Armageddon. Likely the disparity between the 1,260 days and the 1,335 days, amounting to 75 days, is the brief interval from the time the last of the 144,000 are killed until the war of the great day. While people are generally familiar with the uniquely biblical term Armageddon, there even being a popular Hollywood science fiction movie by that title, most people do not really appreciate what the book of Revelation says regarding the place called Armageddon. According to the 16th chapter of Revelation, it is expressions inspired by the demons that influence the world's leaders, gathering them into a situation, into an indirect confrontation with God at a place called Armageddon. Armageddon is a symbolic term for the battlefield in what will be the decisive conflict between humans and God the Almighty, initiated by those who kill God's sons. That is where the expressions inspired by the unclean spirits will ultimately lead the rulers of this world. And I saw three unclean, inspired expressions that looked like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the wild beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. They are, in fact, expressions inspired by demons and they perform signs and they go out to the kings of the entire inhabited earth to gather them together to the war of the great day of God the Almighty. And they gathered them together to the place that is called in Hebrew, Armageddon. Frogs are an appropriate symbol for demonic propaganda. In the days of the Exodus, one of the 10 plagues brought upon Egypt 
was an invasion of hordes of the slimy amphibians. However, through Pharaoh's magicians, the demons seemingly duplicated the miracle, making it appear as if Egypt's demon gods were equal in power to Jehovah. Likewise, we may expect the demonic croakings that draw the kings of the earth into conflict with Almighty God will appear to originate with a divine source. Did not Jesus warn that those who kill his brothers would imagine that they were rendering a sacred service to God? Such is the power of the unholy angels. When will the time of the end begin? As Jesus said, no one knows the day or hour. But judging by the ominously darking future, stemming from the relentless push to provoke war with Russia and China, it ought to be evident that the hour is near. <laughs>